Well, hello and welcome everyone to this, the final installment of our Zoom Jesus International series. Um, throughout this series, we've looked at works uh, that our academics are doing across a variety of disciplines that involve working across national boundaries and international boundaries. Uh, they've included work on languages, on the internet and copyright law, uh, marine biology and cinema. And I'm delighted that uh, we have a brand new other topic tonight from Stefan Durkin looking at uh, developing economies. Say a little bit about Stefan. Uh, Stefan Durkin is Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford and Director of the Centre for the Study of African Economies. His research interests concern what keeps some people and countries poor, the failures of markets, governments and politics mainly in Africa, and how to achieve change. Current research work focuses on the psychological challenges of poverty, the political economy of development, the challenges of industrialization in Africa, the challenges and opportunities of new technologies, and how to organize and finance responses to natural disasters and protracted humanitarian crises. Between 2011 and 2017, he was Chief Economist at the Department of International Development, DFID, the government department in charge of the UK's aid policy and spending. In this position, he provided strategic advice and responsible for ensuring the use of evidence in decision making. Uh, his latest book, Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose, is the topic of tonight's talk. Uh, to which, at this point, I hand over to Stefan. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Um, it's it's great to talk uh, to you. <laughs> I must say, I do recognize a few names online, so hello to to old friends. Um, and um, I I hope um, I can give you a bit of a glimpse of uh, what I talk about in my book, um, as it is building very much not just on my research over a long time on development and as. Peter was implying I've clearly worked on a lot of different things, but uh, it's also very strongly based on the experience I had working in the policy environment. So, you know, working as chief economist of DFID, of when it still existed, Department for International Development in the UK, um, and then also in more recent times, um, trying, um, trying and not necessarily succeeding to be a sensible development policy advisor to uh, two of the latest uh, foreign secretaries in the UK, including someone called Liz Truss, which was definitely not very successful in terms of advice. Um, but I want to talk to you a bit on the argument of the book, and hopefully we leave then enough time uh, to allow you to ask, well, basically anything really, uh, but hopefully also related to to, to the book or, or anything to do with aid. Because that's what I want to talk a little bit about is, is both in the, the bigger picture, how I think I've learned to think and to have a framework of thinking about how some countries seem to be making progress from, from very low living standards and other countries seem to get stuck fairly quickly or never really emerge. And, um, and, and I want to ask also is a bit like, what does it mean for you know being in the UK, um, in a rich country, uh, in terms of development aid, how can we think about it? And maybe indeed, how can we do it do it better? So let me first quickly talk to you a little bit about some style of facts. I decided not to use slides because it's we don't have that much time, but I'll give you a, a quick picture. You know, in the world since 1990, and that's the period since 1990 up to about 2020 that I'm looking at in my book, we've actually made amazing progress in the most extreme forms of poverty. OK, so if we take the kind of extreme poverty as it tends to be calculated and collated between, uh, in a way that is comparable between different countries, the World Bank has particular methods around it. Um, and it's basically people living at really the most uh, destitute levels in terms of some uh, people typically say living below about one point ninety dollars per day per person. Now, you can't do very much with one point ninety dollars um in terms of purchasing power uh that is comparable between country but it's basically what can you do with about two dollars in the us that's not much you can do with it and if you look though across the world you know by not 1990 we probably had about two billion people below that uh that line two billion uh, about 40 percent of the global population a bit more than that even um living below that line 
Most of them live, were living in, in Asia, many of them in, in, in uh, China. So it's probably about a billion in, in Asia, maybe 700 or 750 million were in China. Uh, you had also a big group in South Asia, of which, you know, sometimes the largest country there is, of course, India. Easily more than half the population in India was living below that line. And then also you had Sub-Saharan Africa with a much smaller population than these Asian countries. But there were probably about, well, something like close to 400 million uh, people uh, living uh, below that line in um in, in Asia at the time, a bit less than that, but but definitely a very uh, substantial, sorry, bit in Africa, I should have said, uh, of that. But we actually, since then, we've made a dramatic progress. Since then, we've actually reduced probably these global extreme poverty levels uh, by about two thirds. Okay, so again, it's, a, it's at a line, at a kind of a level of standard of living that is really low, but that's remarkable. That's for a lot of people going from the most destitute levels to a little bit better. A reduction by two thirds, but very uneven across the world. In East Asia, China, um, especially, you've got declines to actually now levels from what was about a billion there in East Asia, Southeast Asia, to maybe levels now of below 100 million. Um, in South Asia, we've also, a bit later on, but start making a lot of progress, especially in the in the 2000s. Um, and now we would say, well, that's probably easily half there in terms of the numbers. The only thing is that in sub-Saharan Africa, actually these numbers have crept up probably to about 450 million. 450 million now um, after COVID, that's actually roughly the same level we had six years ago. And in fact, COVID probably set us back in the fight against extreme poverty in the world by uh, by about six years. Now, behind that is uh, still further differentiation. We tend to say, oh, in Africa, it's really stagnation in, in extreme poverty and, and, and it all stays stuck. Well, actually, there are countries even in, in sub-Saharan Africa where poverty has declined dramatically. We have, for example, Ghana and Ethiopia, where the extreme poverty levels are actually halved as well. So you actually have only half the number of people in extreme poverty now than you had in 1990. So that's remarkable progress. However, in sub-Saharan Africa, you have also countries where the number of extreme poor people has actually doubled. Countries like Nigeria, countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, actually also Malawi, and probably also, maybe not doubled, but definitely strong increases in Kenya and Zambia. So there's countries where we actually have a vast increase, while other countries we have these declines. It's that differentiation, the differential experience around poverty that motivates a lot of what I wanted to write about in my book. Um, and you get on actually countries where this change has happened and in very different ways. In fact, the one thing that is in common, it involves the growth of the economy. Okay, so we talk a lot about of, you know, why do we keep on talking about growth in the world and whatever? I am not that interested in growth in Europe or in, 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 in the UK. And if it needs to be done for climate change, if we can't get green growth, I'm quite happy for us to actually a bit uh, negative growth and are going a bit down because, you know, we are emitting at a scale that's unsustainable. But we do this at consumption levels, and at income levels that are, um, say, relative to a country like Ethiopia, we're doing this at 10 times the standard of living, the incomes per capita than we have in a country like Ethiopia. You know, we, we should just be, be conscious, and it's actually uh, much more than 10 times, it's like 15 times, 20 times than a country like Ethiopia. You know, if you are in a world like that, you know, we are the ones that should go down. But the kind of income levels that you have where people are barely living at a few dollars a day equivalent, you know, what you can acquire for it, you can't buy a phone with that, you know, you can't do any of the basic things that we feel like it's quite probably a good thing that people can afford it, uh, even if they're relatively poor. You need actually to grow these economies because actually simply redistribution of incomes, you know, if your GDP per capita, like in Burundi, is like $350 per person per year, you know, um, you know, if that's the average income, 
you know, that's not much. And, you know, the cost of living may be a bit lower, but not that dramatic that you can actually have a decent life in that. You need to grow this economy because redistribution, every have, everybody having $350 is not going to help you. So actually, we see that these declines in extreme poverty all over the world, they are correlated with economic growth. Yes, some countries a bit dirtier growth than in other places, but the growth was important. It's actually kind of a necessary condition for, uh, for poverty, poverty declines. Probably not sufficient. In some countries, it was probably sufficient and the markets took care, take care of it in the way that the things was happening. In most countries, you don't, you do need to get other things as well and focus on distribution. But anyway, it's this, this differential progress. And in the book, I do a lot of case studies from very different types of countries and then look at their progress. So I look at a country like China, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Ghana, Ethiopia. These are all countries where poverty has progressed dramatically, where also the economies have been expanding. But you don't need to know a lot about these countries to recognize they sound like quite different. You know, China doesn't sound like Ethiopia in terms of what's going on, the, the way, what, what are happening there. But Ghana, for example, is a reasonably functioning democracy. It's also made these progress. Bangladesh, maybe we should say, used to be a very reasonably functional economy, uh, pro democracy, not quite like that. It's definitely not like China. Um, these countries are quite different. Indonesia is now a, a, a decently functioning democracy as well. So they are all very different in terms of the, the, the progress. In fact, and as I will I also explain in the book, and so many of you will know, the nature of these economies. You know, the Bangladesh, the economy is far more market-based. Indonesia as well. In China, of course, the state plays a massive role in it. Ethiopia, for those who know a bit about it, used actually much more state-led development where Ghana did that not. Actually, the important thing is they did also, they, they are quite different countries in their politics, in their history, in the way their economies function. But they have in common that this progress is there. And that actually is quite an important challenge. You know, We often, even when we work on development, say as I did from a government in the UK, you know, we like to think, you know, that our development model surely is the one that everybody should have. So we love exporting the Westminster model and we love exporting, you know, somewhat market led uh, economies. But, you know, the way we do our economies is not quite like America. And of course, the US likes to export even more the market led model. And you go to some Europeans where the state is maybe more important. You know, also across our rich economies, there's some bit of differences but probably not actually as big a difference as in how these countries progressed in recent times. And so it's an old question in development economics, in the economics of development that I focus on. So how does it that countries get richer and, and not? And, you know, a very common explanation, very popular actually in the policy world as well. David Cameron loved the main book that is written about it, that's popularized, you know, Why Nations Fail, that book is called. David Cameron used to say, that's my favorite book. Well, they basically say, well, it's all about institutions. And the successful countries are the countries that actually have been able to emulate institutions as we know them, market-based institutions, but also constitutional democracies, rule of law, property rights, and the whole thing. And it's true that most Western countries, all Western countries that were successful, and also Japan, have quite well embedded systems that look like this institutional uh, setup that we have. You know, related people will say, well, if it's institutions, we should understand how these institutions came about. And it's actually coming through history, a kind of a historical uh, historical role. And so, of course, some people will say, well, Africa has poor institutions because it had colonialism and the history is then the main determinant. So in a sense, what these explanations tell us, that history is the main determinant really of this institutional development, and that actually causes development or underdevelopment in different places. Now, there's a lot of truth in that and any historians online don't worry i will admit that it's entirely true but if we start looking at countries that were successful and then actually start looking at look if there are successful countries i look in my book at there's also some serious failures like nigeria like the democratic republic of congo uh like myanmar they are they're failing failing places now 
What's quite interesting is that Nigeria had colonialism just like Ghana had. Of course, it was maybe a bit different. Um, Ethiopia didn't have colonialism and was successful, but maybe has a whole series of other kind of institutional features. Um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, it had uh, colonialism as well. But actually, they're all within Africa. And actually, there is an element of similarity still in some of these conditions that they were facing. But some of them seem to have been able to do something more constructive with it, like Ghana in recent times, than others. Um, same in Asia, of course, you have histories of colonialism in Bangladesh, and it's been quite successful. So, you know, why is it? So, so I put it very simply, it's not sufficient as an explanation of why some people make progress or not. It's surely, and I'm, I'm one of the people who'd say, look, it's an important impediment on development, some of these historical factors, but it can't be enough. There's still something about that countries that actually don't have either, uh, that, 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 that don't have, call it a, a, a history that is a good starting point for them, or indeed, have these institutions of the rule of law and no corruption and so on. You know, all these countries that I'm describing in the kind of success story, there's still plenty of corruption and so on. They're actually all perf imperfect in their kind of institutional development, and they all have histories that may hinder development. Still, in recent times, Nigeria has been terribly stagnant and has doubled its extreme poverty. Um, but on the other hand, you have other countries on the continent in sub-Saharan Africa that made a lot of progress. So you have to ask yourself, well, that's quite striking. So it's not simply trying to export Westminster institutions or even looking for institutional perfection first before you can develop. It's clearly not, uh, not, not necessary. It may be good later on, and I'm definitely not saying corruption is good, but somehow you can still start, and the last 30 years have shown that. Related. So, you know, I mean, oh, sorry, I should finish this point and simply saying the fact that institutions don't have to be perfect is probably actually quite good news because we know that it takes really a lot of effort to build up institutions. It actually means you can go to countries and say, look, you can have a future. Yes, you have colonial histories. You can, you have uh, not the institutions, the rule of law, or the, 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 the um, protection of, of property rights or whatever, but actually you can still make quite a lot of progress despite that. So that's actually quite good news. And it's much better than me being at the time instructed as chief economist of DFID, go around the world, um, because I never really listened to my bosses totally, but in principle, I should go, and David Cameron was the prime minister then, I should have gone around and saying, look, we really believe in the UK, that's what you need to do, you need to get these institutions right, that's the care thing, and yes, history is a strong determinant of the institutions, I know that, but you know, you need to fix these. But actually, if I'm really honest, if I went to Nigeria, which I did many times, and had to go and talk to the to the team of President Buhari, which I also ended up doing a lot. If I if, and they used to ask me, you know, how do you think this country now can develop? Surely, with a straight face, I could never have given the answer. Well, uh, maybe you should have tried to get a better history, not least when I came from the old colonial masters. And so you get somehow that it's also a very uncomfortable explanation. This whole institutional explanation. It's very uncomfortable, especially if you try to support countries to try to get out of it. Now, again, the good news is there that you didn't have to have perfection. So the other part of it, what's quite interesting in recent times, is if you look at these countries, what have they been doing? They've actually um, doing quite a lot of different things in terms of, say, their economic policies. Now, there used to be a time, you know, not so long ago in the 1990s, that again, often supported by the UK and by, by Western countries, they would go around the world and saying, look, the blueprint for development is, and people refer to it sometimes later on as Washington Consensus, a particular model of, you know, market-led development, privatization, uh, building up uh, quickly tax authorities, and, and, and a very simplified blueprint of how development came, came about. A little bit, 
influenced, I think, by by Reaganomics and, and Thatcherism in the 1980s, and then saying, look, that's the way to do it. You know, even in our own countries, we've moved quite a bit away from that. But that was definitely something like the, the kind of simplified version of economics. Uh, you know, just get the markets work and everything will be fine. Now, what's quite interesting where you look across these countries, and I already alluded to it, you know, you have plenty of failing countries that tried it. But they also have plenty of failing countries that tried state-led development. Similarly, you have lots of successful countries that actually did much more through the state and successful countries who did much more by the market. Now, that's actually quite interesting. In fact, a review not so long ago published um, from lots of successful countries over a much longer period of time, 30 years, all the way up to 2010, uh, it was a review actually commissioned by the World Bank by a Nobel Prize winner came to the conclusion and saying, well, actually, we don't really know the recipe of success in growth and development. We know the ingredients. You know, you have to do something about infrastructure. You need to probably have stable macroeconomics. You need to do something sensible about um, education. You need to probably let the markets do some things and, and, and at least re reflect somehow market signals and find a way of dealing with this and so on. So you get some kind of common sense advice that's not very precise. And that's very interesting here um, because if you look at the countries, clearly they all try to do some different things. And that's actually another good news. You don't just have to have perfect inst institutions. You actually have a bit of room for maneuver. You can try things out that probably work, work within your country, work within the politics, Sometimes it fits better the ideology of those with power to do more state led, sometimes a bit less. You don't have to do this kind of, there is no perfect, there is none of these perfect blueprints. And these countries indeed did quite a variety of, of, of things of doing. So that's again quite, quite uh, interesting. But it, for me, it leads down to the kind of real question that I struggled with in thinking about development and what countries can do. If actually you don't have to be perfect in your institutions to start with, you don't have to have a particular blueprint for economic policies, but you actually have some room for maneuver. You can actually do quite, it's not so hard, it seems, to do something reasonable that makes you progress. Maybe not the perfection, maybe not China growth rates or whatever, but you can do quite a lot. Then the question arises, why are there countries like Nigeria that screw up their economies? Why are there countries like the DRC that now are only at the GDP per capita a third of what they were in 1990? Why is it that Malawi, a peaceful country for a very long time, is essentially stagnant? Why is it the same in Niger, where until recently I had a lot of stability and they could actually do it? Why do you have these countries and still in the world where actually, despite what was clearly a period where whole series of countries, despite the world economy, which despite history, um, despite all kinds of other forces could make quite a lot of progress in poverty reduction, why didn't it happen there? And that actually comes down to the core of what my argument is my book. You know, I'm an economist that couldn't help but discover uh, politics as well. That actually, if you have space to do reasonable things, why do they do unreasonable economic policies? And in fact, I've learned by this is that the best economic advice that you can give to countries is not to do stupid things. But in Nigeria, I kept on going there and trying to explain forever why having seven exchange rates, especially where you then give some people access to a really good exchange rate and then allow them to go and sell at, an, at a much higher exchange rate to dollars back, that that's a bad idea. And it probably is really good for corruption. And it's really good to create lots of uncertainty in your economy and a lot of privilege for certain groups and whatever. So you have to ask yourself, why do they do this? Well, for me, the concept that I use in my book is that actually these countries, you have to understand in general, sorry, I should not say these countries, that in all countries, Somehow there is something we should call, probably here as, a, as an analytical tool, elites. These are groups with power and influence. This is not just the aristocrats in Britain. This is not just 
um, you know, religious leaders in a particular country or a, a cabal of military leaders in another country. It's actually an elite, it's probably a bit more. These are the people in politics, in the military, probably in civil society as well, definitely in the civil, in the public administration, probably in the universities because they help to tell the stories and so on, maybe even journalists that actually somehow are have influence and power. I must say, in the last two years working in FCDO, advising Dominic Raab and Liz Truss, you clearly see there is someone there, there's people with far more access, they're far more connected, and they actually are far more influential uh, than, than other people. There's definitely some people far more equal than others in our societies as well. I call these the elites. Could be a handful of people, a dozen people, a few hundred people, a few thousand people, but definitely not millions, okay? And these are the people that somehow or another determine not necessarily the historical institutions, but just how we interpret them at that time. Okay, for those in the UK listening in, it's a bit like how Johnson interpreted all kinds of laws and international laws differently than maybe we were used to in Britain. Okay, that's what I mean by it. These, are, not, these people have enough power and influence, and they, within the institutions that they have, the history they have, they run a country in a particular way, they have implicit agreements of how a country can be run or not. In fact, there is a lot of basis for this idea of elite bargains also in economic historians. Douglas North, Nobel Prize winner, writes about it and he says actually a state is best understood as a coalition, a dominant coalition of people who actually say, look, we are agreeing as a, 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 to control big part of the, the, the benefits uh, the rents in the economy, the access to the resources, the way the state is run, as a way of actually keeping the whole place peaceful and stable. So we actually use this as a stabilizing force to actually say, look, all the people with power and influence, this is, this is, you know, this is how we somehow control the cake. It doesn't mean they put them all in their own pockets, not at all, but somehow another is an understanding it. You know, we have an elite bargain in the UK that is totally fine that. Um, about 500 people in Scotland control 50% of the land. It means we don't find it totally fine that inheritance laws and other forms of wealth accumulation more recently, but a lot of it is inheritance laws, are perfectly fine. Even if it goes back a thousand years, you know, we have no problem with that. You know, what the hell do they, these people have the right at that time to capture it, probably do some battles and through some violence? Oh, we don't mind about that. We find it still totally fine. And that's indeed part of our elite bargain for the stability for our society, not to try to question that. In fact, one act of our parliament could change this, but we choose not to do. Now that happens everywhere in the world, including in developing countries. And so somehow or another, they have a deal to run the state, maybe to steal from the citizens. That's actually what clearly has been happening in the DRC for far too long. If you control the state, you have the right to plunder. Or you could do it in Nigeria, where if you control the state, and of course it costs a lot of money to be able to control the state, as we noticed in the latest elections, um, but if you then control the state, you have the right essentially to distribute the key rent of that society and economy, which is oil rents. You in the end control which are the official and unofficial ways that people can control the rents that are distributed in that system. And so you can do that. Now, you could have a lot of different ones like that. Many states, including a little bit our own, but maybe not so much, have systems where those people who have good jobs or get contracts from the state, it often is linked somehow as a reward for loyalty. Think of PPP in, uh, PPE sorry, in the UK. Um, um, and I don't mean it as the degree, but I meant of the protective gear. Um, but basically that you that you get during COVID, you know, connected people can get the contracts. Now, of course, we have lots of societies where that's almost a rigor that all the time, these are the ways that these controls help. Now, where does that link to it? To do the story I want to tell, I actually want to have the core point is that if we look across the developing world, it's not so hard to look at some of these countries that at some point begin to emerge 
that somehow or another in their elite bargain, a, a focus on growth and development emerges and becomes stronger. That's something we saw in China in 79. Economic policy based on ideology disappeared. Now, the elite bargain is the same. It's still the Communist Party that does everything they can to su survive. And indeed, in 79, it happened with Deng Xiaoping. But actually, they chose to do this through gaining legitimacy from the population through more food security and growth. So actually, they became developmental as part of legitimacy for their way of their elite bargain. In Ghana, it probably was in the mid-1990s that the political elite was willing to buy into some form of stability, i.e. let the new constitution that was more democratic, let it function. And, um, and somehow or another bought into it. And we got a stability in politics in Ghana that actually helped it all the way up to now. It's now fragile again with the big deep economic crisis, but for about almost 30 years, we actually had a political stability that could give us a lot and more politics based on looking for progress in development and in growth and arguably um, um, a better success. And so you can go through these different countries that actually this, this kind of bargains happened. Maybe in the Q&A, uh, I can talk a bit about Bangladesh, which is an amazing place for that, where actually you got an elite bargain that allowed, for example, even though the elite controlled the state, but the state was very dysfunctional. But clearly, somewhere in the mid-1980s, 90s, they needed to, they, they, they implicitly agreed more should be delivered. But they were self-aware enough of a state that they couldn't quite do it. And what do we have in Bangladesh? We have the largest NGO in the world, BRAC. It's the largest NGO in the world, single-handedly responsible for a lot of the programs in health, some in education, also in, in social protection. The, the amazing thing about Bangladesh is not that BRAC is so effective and so big, but that the state allowed an NGO to almost become bigger than the state in certain parts of the countries, in certain sectors. That was what Bangladesh said. The elite said, look, we need to make progress in development here. It's important. It becomes part of our deal here that we can have. And so that's in my book, I talk about these different countries where this happened, but also these places where this just is not happening. And in fact, if we look at the history in the last 40, 50 years, we see this emerging in more and more of these developing countries. We saw it in India, but we don't see it in Pakistan. We saw it in Bangladesh. We saw it in, in a lot of East Asian countries earlier on, Southeast Asians, and we see it in African countries. And that gives me hope. I want to finish with the last few minutes by actually saying, okay, what does deal mean for, for you know, what, 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 should I, what should I have told and say a different in the UK development support? Now, it's really tricky, you know, because a lot of what we do in international development, whether we are an NGO uh, that works maybe at scale in the country, um, or definitely when we work as a government, in aid or indeed as an international organization like the UN or the World Bank. You know, we, we tend to assume that the place we work and the people we work with, the governments and so on, maybe less as an NGO, but definitely in general as the bilaterals or the multilaterals, as we call them, World Bank or UNICEF or whatever, we tend to assume that they also want development and they're actually quite happy for us to try to actually give support in development. Now, if somehow in that elite bargain, that, that deal between these powerful groups and people, growth and development is a big enough part of the deal, well, then actually, it's easy. You know, you work with them, you can do all kinds of things. You know, that's the experience of people working in Bangladesh. That was the experience of people working in Ethiopia until uh, COVID and unfortunately the conflict. But there was definitely the kind of sense they had in Ghana as well. And definitely the sense that you can't really do that in Nigeria. Actually, so little of it sticks. Our model is really geared towards that. But what do you do in a country where the elite bargain is absolutely not interested in development? Well, if you don't work with the government, are you not trying to give them an excuse not to do anything? In fact, they're probably more interested in the rents to capture from it, the, 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 the freebies, the sites, or indeed, you help them to give them legitimacy to, to be in power. But actually, 
they're not really trying to develop the country. In the last 10, 15 years, Nigeria, the federal government, has not tried to develop. It's absolutely not the case. In the DRC, maybe now a little bit with the current government, but, but under Mobutu and then Kabila, father and son, that was not at all what the state was about. That was not what they were interested in. So what do you do then? Are you then or saying, OK, I don't work with government, I do something in parallel. But then you got the Nigeria situation that we've worked on health in Nigeria, probably in development aid from the UK for 60 years. But this is the country that spends itself virtually nothing um, on uh, health. In fact, the lowest share of a government budget spent on health, you find that in Nigeria, it's the lowest share of the total budget that goes on health there. So are you just basically compensating for it, but even giving them an excuse? Indeed, the excuse for the elite to function as they do. And I can't remember the last time I have had ever an interlocutor in a senior position in Nigeria, and they didn't tell me, or oh, next time I'm, when I'm in my house in London, I will, maybe we should meet up and chat a little bit more. I remember the chief of staff of Buhari saying, oh, which university are you in? Oh, it's Oxford. Oh, I have a flat in Oxford and in Cambridge, so I can come anywhere you want to actually come and have a chat with you. You know, if you're dealing with these people, what legitimacy do you give them? And it goes even further. You say, well, maybe we do some NGO work or charity work. And I finish with that uh, in a humanitarian type of work in crisis. I ended up going at some point to South Sudan and go, you know, into while the civil war was ongoing, uh, not so long ago, about five, six years ago, I go in rebel held territory with the UN helicopter and I land there and look, this is quite new for me. And I go around and see at the airport, I see all these NGOs having uh, big places there, big, 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 uh, big, big, big uh, houses and, 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 and things. And actually very few guards and so on. I say, I'm a bit puzzled by it. I see the, the food storage place from w, for the World Food Programme. Uh, nobody's guarding it. I say, it's all very puzzling. I thought I'm in a war zone here with some rebels that clearly, you know, is that just left open? So you go and I go and talk to the big chief from the rebels there. And I ask him there, it's interesting, you know, there's all these NGOs here. Uh, what do you think of them? I say, oh, they're my friends. They've been here for 20 years. They're our friends here. You know, they allow me to get on with the business of war. I really came away from there that these, in the end, in a place like South Sudan, I wondered whether we're not just prolonging it, whether we're actually not giving having a negative influence on where these places can go. I worry about in many of the countries where there is no elite bargain and where it's really so fractured. You know, we are potentially doing harm. Now, people say, well, there's still human beings that we need to help. Yes, but maybe it is the case in some countries that by helping the current generation of children, we're condemning many more generations of children to be dependent on us. And is that the right way? And we can't help everybody. And we don't really can't do this. So what are we sometimes doing there? And for me, that asks very big questions. And... Um, and I'm very open to listen to your questions and, and hopefully can say something sensible. Brilliant, Stefan. Thank you so much for that really insightful and fascinating talk. Uh, if you do have questions for Stefan, if you'd like to type them in the chat box, I will pose them to him. But to, um, to, to get us started, um, what do you think was the biggest surprise you came across if that's the right way of phrasing it, when you started working at DFID? Was there anything from when you'd looked at it an academic way that suddenly when you got on, uh, on the ground itself that suddenly you thought, oh, wow, this is completely different? Okay, so many things. I mean, God, I was in shock, you know, and you can hear from my accent, I, I'm not even British. So I was doing this as a Belgian citizen coming into working as a senior civil servant in this whole place. Now, one thing anyone who... Um, one is about this sometimes, you know, it, it helped, of course, there were only five people above me. I was pretty senior there, but uh, we are coming as an academic. OK, first thing I noticed is that um, I suddenly realized why they don't trust academics, because they really don't trust an outsider can't be trusted. And it's an incredible paranoia in the whole system. And it's a funny thing is that once you're inside, they trust you totally, which was great for me. 
but it's actually very striking is how difficult it is for civil servants. And I spent a lot of time these days trying to actually look for better ways that as academics, we can link into the civil service, but also vice versa, that they learn to trust us. But trust is important, you know, you have to work in a confidential environment and the whole thing. And academics love to, to say the things. The second thing is I discovered how useless academics often are when they go into the civil service. And it's a bit like, you know, when you are dealing with policymakers, you know, of course, they have today's problem. And you can bring an academic in and say, oh, what shall I do about it? And say, well, you know, I don't really know as an academic. But if you give me some money in five years, I can give you the answer. Um, on the other hand, they would enthusiastically saying, oh, I've been done this tiny little piece of research. You know, as academics, we work on answering very precisely, very, uh, very precise, small questions. That's a good academic. Very particular things, very well answered. So we try to excitedly tell you about this village in Ethiopia that you that I worked on and the kind of thing. Of course, they don't want to hear that because they actually want to know what is the state of knowledge. And academics forget that. And then many more things that I, that I learned, like um, how evidence is used and, and, and how the things. But I will tell you, I <laughs> saying this as an academic at Jesus College, I actually think I had the best time of my life working inside this whole thing because it was so illuminating. And, and I will tell you something about academics. You know, my God, they're brutal, difficult people with incredibly few social skills. And then working the civil service in a real collective was actually quite a joy. Fantastic. Um, I just uh, we haven't had to, if anybody, I say, please feel free, or if you prefer to just raise your hand and ask a question and turn your camera on, that's absolutely fine as well. But um, while we wait for another one, uh, you mentioned Bangladesh and how you might want to talk a bit more about that. So um, tell us more about, because I think from what you were saying, that's potentially a ray of hope. Anyway, yeah. Bangladesh. No, it's actually, uh, so, so Bangladesh is a really interesting place. And, and in fact, I go around Africa now talking about Bangladesh and trying to make them understand. So, so I'll tell you a couple of things on, 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 on the history. Of course, it, 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 won, <laughs> it gained its independence, um, uh, only very late from, from West Pakistan with a brutal war immediately followed in the early 1970s uh, with a famine. And then you had several, you know, big, big strife between the, between those who then uh, were in power. Uh, uh, they did, and indeed, and it led actually to Henry Kissinger, the, the, the former Secretary of State in the US, to say actually in the early 1980s, Bangladesh is a basket case. You know, if, if you get a senior politician from America say you're a basket case, that's quite striking. Actually, interestingly, well, it, it looked like that, you know, environmental problem, massive demography, you know, incredible poverty and destitution and so on. But actually, what is really interesting that in the right in the, somewhere in the mid 1980s or early 90s, somehow or another, a whole series of things happened, both in the private sector, both in civil society and in, and in politics, that actually somehow or another, a whole new way of looking at uh, uh, what was emerging. It was reflected in, you know, in the spirit of the time you know, you win the state, you could try to control the state, you do lots of state-led development. They started to liberalize quite a lot. They were lucky that then, because of pure coincidence, a garment factory from a uh, Dai Wolf from Korea had tried to do garment factories there that all failed, but a lot of people got trained up and they all set up a gar garment factories. They suddenly had an export sector as well. And then I mentioned it on BRAC, an NGO that was growing, but actually the whole thing is that rather than doing what you would have expected in the history of the 70s, that there would be a lot of attempts by different elite players to capture all the rents, to, to, to fight with each other, a consensus emerged that actually they really should be uh, allowing growth and development to take place. And what's really interesting, if you look at the data now, nobody knows exactly when this happens. I was in Bangladesh in, in June again. People recognize that there's something clearly shifted in. And now, of course, this is a country that has had, from this real destitute position, serious growth, half the extreme poverty. Um, it has done excellent outcomes for health. Tip a Muslim country where the outcomes for girls are better than for boys, and so on. And yes, there's all kinds of challenges now, but this is one of these real places coming from nowhere, really actually become almost a, a good example for other countries. And this is in a context of a state 
that always was quite dysfunctional. There is a lot of corruption. There is a lot of imperfection. There's a lot of these imperfections there, but despite that, they managed to get out. Yeah. Fantastic. Ah, oh, we do. We, we have quite a few now in the box. So um, first question from Liz. Um, won't the elite of Nigeria compare themselves with Ghana and make changes? Um, sorry, the elite from Nigeria compared themselves to Ghana. Sorry. The... Yes. I, I guess, so yes, the... Um... Will 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 they base themselves on the Ghanaian model, maybe? And maybe? no, no. So so look. Okay. So I, I have to be very careful, and I, I shouldn't. Um, I should I should be a bit careful with the use of words, and I I really don't mean this in a in a in in an awful way. But the but there is something about these powerful players, definitely these elite in Nigeria, that they are thinking the only country they will ever compare themselves with is is America, and they think they are America. They 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 use all the the insignias of the state uh, copying from from the US. They definitely don't think very much of Ghana. They do think they're doing extremely well. There is a kind of a thing, and for me, it's always that power, privilege, and money allows you to be deeply arrogant. So this is this is an element that I have, and these elite, so they don't, and it's actually really striking. Of course, you have other players. You know, even during these recent elections. The candidate that didn't win that actually came third but actually had a quarter of the votes now you know actually i i meant end up meeting in fact i did a talk like this in front of this presidential candidate um and we talked quite a lot about bangladesh afterwards you know there are people there even in the elite, the elite that would like some change but money talks so much it is so stuck that they won't be doing this look and i will have to be careful the ghanaian elite is not necessarily a bunch of nice people a lot of this focus on growth and development, they also, all these elites do that out of self-interest as well, either because they're concerned they will be kicked out of power, or they think like, if we can get to do it, we'll, we'll get even more profits for ourselves and so on. So, so let's not idealize the Ghanaian elite either, but somehow or another, they at least converged on some idea that actually sensible ways of doing policy making and growth and progress and development seems to be better. It emerged now as more as a democracy where people tend to vote a bit more based on development outcomes and so on. So anyway, yeah. So there's so much more to be said, um, but it's uh, unfortunately the the answer is no. They won't compare themselves. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. We have a question uh, here from someone who lived in Bangladesh for seven years in the 1970s in the university and with an NGO. There were two presidential assassinations, but the country developed. Very useful. The country was resource poor, but very open to foreign NGOs. Significant. No, it's a really interesting thing. If we look at the data, you said the country developed, and it's an interesting thing. The data didn't show that in the 70s. So you're, you're kind of alluding to things were already happened. And NGOs, of course, in the late 1970s were already doing things. You remember, that was the time that uh, ORS, the oral rehydration, uh, the, 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 you know, the salt and sugar mixture that was pioneered in Bangladesh at scale, including by BRAC. You know, that's all these things. There were things happening. But actually, the economies were definitely not they were not progressing then. Uh, the state was definitely not that functioning and so on. I think what you probably saw there, I'm actually pleased to hear it and I, and I maybe should later on be in touch. So there's a wonderful book from, by Naomi Hossein who traces some of these progress in the 80s and 90s indeed back to the experience of the, of the 70s. But it was much more still a recovery from the most extremes. And then actually they, they set up uh, a better thing. But the question you ask is resource poor. Was that helpful? Look, Malawi is resource poor and it's not developing. Okay, so it probably helped when they wanted to develop to do it in a sensible way. And I would say that if you have a lot of resources like in Nigeria, the status quo is really attractive. Um, I call my back gambling on development because often for the elite, the status quo is really is, is, is so well known and quite attractive. If you have a lot of natural resources, it's even more attractive to keep it as it is. You know, you, you can still buy your house in London. You don't have to have the country growing. And maybe it is indeed the case that in Bangladesh, growth was required also for the elite to earn some rents. But it's not sufficient, but maybe it was helpful. It's definitely not sufficient. Malawi is not developing, not growing. It's been stagnant for a long time, um, also without natural resources. Great. We have a question now from Graham. How has DFID being absorbed by the FCO affected the quality of UK aid? Oh, it's dreadful. 
<laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, it's uh, and I'm since leaving also a little bit more. In fact, just before you, uh, we got online, I was, I was WhatsApping again with journalists and so on, uh, because the the a, the budget came out again and so on. I mean, it is really really bad, and the, the morale is deep, is incredibly low in. Um, uh, in in in, uh, in in FCDO, I was brought in the day before the mergers tried to help to keep the development thing. I totally failed that, you know, with RAP and with trust, especially on the trust, it was dreadful. And um, yeah, I'll just be blunt. And I know it's broad, it can be broadcast, it can be viewed, but yeah, it was dreadful. The morale is low. It's a bit stabilized now. The current foreign secretary does. I mean, you know, it's not about politics here that I want to say, but more of personalities and, and efforts. The current foreign secretary is definitely doing his best. The development minister, Andrew Mitchell, has been brought back in. He knows that kind of work. He stabilizes the thing. But, you know, even today's announcements imply that there's another five billion cuts in the budget over the next two years. That means actually for the next for, for, for the next two years, that's cumulative cuts of 13 million so, sorry, 13 billion pounds of the aid budget since if we compare it where when I when I joined in 2020 FCDO, we thought we would be now. So that's that's a massive decline as well. Of course, that does amazing things to morale. The quality, you know, there is a potential with a foreign office combination. You know, eight, eight is political, and that's what I write my book about. Eight has a political dimension in it. You, you're not neutral. You can't be neutral ever, I think, in, in development aid. You're always affecting it by by not speaking up or by speaking up. You're always affecting up, but uh, it could potentially be. But at the moment, it's not there. So I, I leave it. Leave it. You know, there, there, there's reasons to have it together with the foreign office in development. There's reasons to have it separate. That's for me less of the issue. It's more the way it all the things is done. Okay, I'll take. We now have a question from your former student Peter Wilson. He's saying yeah. hello. Um, I suppose the next question is why elites in different places will have different attitudes. What influences their psychology? Are we back to history and institutions? Or would you take an, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this name here, an Asamoglu and Robinson view that it's more about, for example, the dominant forms of economic activity, for yeah, example, yeah. presence or absence of natural resources. Yeah. Okay, so so hi Peter, I, I saw you earlier uh, connecting. It's great to, to have you uh, on this. And um, the... Um, the, the, the question here, so Asimogli Robinson, this is the why nations fail, fail the institutional, and then one of the reasons is probably or indeed natural resources can influence the nature of these institutions that are researchers. You know, I put a lot more weight, not, not, no, I put at least as much weight on this kind of historical and structural factors on the agency, the actors that actually are there. Now, what is then interesting that brings them back to, you know, are there maybe some of the actors, you know, I don't like the idea it's all about one leader or something, but somehow, somehow leaders in plural within these elites that actually can motivate others to join. So there's a social psychology element in it. And there is a bit of kind of, can I build, because, you know, um, development and elite bargains for development is about coalition building, is about getting people on track and is enthusing them, wanting to buy into it, because again, the gain will not come immediately. In fact, for the elite, it is a bit of a risk to embark on much more these kind of things, going away from the status quo. So I agree with you, there's probably an element there, social psychology and the kind of things. You know, Someone told me, Lee Kuan Yew, eh? so the Singaporean leader that led supposedly Singapore to, to this fast development and this incredible progress since the 1960s, you know, people describe him as a very good coalition builder, a very good broker. That must mean personality traits come into it. You know, you can't be an obnoxious person. You, you, it's unlikely that, that, that your standard academic will be able to do this, uh, to, to broker the coalition. You know, you, you can't be, you, you have to have a particular type of persons involved in that. So I take that and I say that's a very good point. Fantastic. Uh, we have a question now from Penny. Uh, yeah. Where she says it's easier to see what you shouldn't do in aid. I always found it hard to decide what you should do. If you were starting again in Nigeria as chief economist to FCDO, what would you do? Hi, Penny. I noticed you got online. It's uh, it's wonderful to have you. I hope you're you're you're, you're well. And of course, you had a hard job. I could be the advisor. You had to be the decision maker in an organization. So uh, being a decision maker is much harder. But if I started again in Nigeria as chief economist. 
Um, you know, this I'm ambivalent about it because I I think on the one hand I tried very hard. I would have started earlier, recognizing that for God's sake, what can I do? Because we did all kinds of things, all the way to being told of by the UK by, by the Treasury that we were promoting policies that were against the UK policy view on whatever on economics and so on. We were trying all kinds of things to do it. But what I would probably do differently in terms of my powers of signing off as quality assurance person, as chief economist, for some of the bigger projects, I would probably not have done some of our big programs in the North without actually having a much clearer way of thinking. I would have spent essentially much less on Nigeria. I wouldn't, I would have still done some of the things we did on the influencing and so on, but I would not have spent some of these big programs in Nigeria. Some of the health system works that indeed I signed off on. There's nothing to be seen in more in Northern Nigeria. This is hundreds of million pounds. Having said that, of course, at that moment itself, they help people directly, but there's nothing sustainable. This is the difference a little bit, what I more and more appreciate is that we must be willing sometimes to make a distinctions of doing good and doing development. Development is about change and sustainability and, and have that change. We can do good, but then maybe some of these programs we did, they made that, that was a very expensive way of doing good. And maybe we could have done, done other things as well and so on. So I felt it, felt that I, I would have I would have been more ruthless. And I'm sure you will disagree. Maybe I would not have done all the things in Malawi we did. It was clear for a long time how how static and un unwilling for anything to, to really try to invest in making progress. And I would have put more of the resources in the places where it looked like there was a chance of, of doing this. You know what I find striking? That in a series of countries, and we don't have enough time, but several countries um, that were actually, that I would say they were progressing and they were trying to do things in the period between 2015 and 2020, they all went to the commercial debt market, so sovereign bonds. So they went to, to take on debt. And many of them are now indebted countries. I think, and then meanwhile, we gave our biggest uh, loans from the World Bank, either concessional loans to Pakistan, to DRC and to Nigeria. I think there's something fundamentally wrong in the way we allocate. I would do that different and not give Nigeria at that stage uh, as much money. This was not a regime we knew very quickly though to work with and we were uh, illude, allude, uh, it was an illusion that they were generally trying to do something. Fantastic. Um, have a, uh, ah. In fact, Penny's just put that she would do the same. It's very tough, but tough love, question mark. Um, penultimate question now from uh, Jennifer. Given the importance of health systems, how would you see donors such external finance into health systems in Nigeria could be done differently, taking into account the elite bargaining? How can community systems be used in Nigeria and elsewhere and how community systems fit with the elite bargain? Yeah, no, so, so look, Community systems don't work in isolation. Actually, VRC is a very good example where despite this total failing of the state, community services in health and education run by the church, initially largely Catholic church, although the Protestants got very big there, both of these running these things. They were, they created a lot of resilience, you know? So, so there is a, there's a really tricky thing there. The, the night, the night on the, in Nigeria, the kind of scale as an outside aid organization, you know, we, you know, you, you, you were, you, you were, we were kidding as I think that we were really building systems that were sustainable, that actually that, that there was enough interest of those who had to sustain it to want to sustain it. Um, how can community systems be used? So look, with your eyes wide open, is my, would be my advice. You know, I'm, I've, I've far less critique on some kind of smaller programs that NGOs may do and so on. I worry about the NGO model that it really does the big change, but if you just want to do good, you can, un, you can do this, but you do it with your eyes wide open. You know, you're not building the systems, um, the, 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 the dude, but then the question is, and I'm not going to answer is, Nigeria and elsewhere, how do community systems fit in the elite bargain? Well, in a very particular way, locally, and you need to understand that. And if you don't understand that, you're actually creating the same either uh, semi-dependency, so from the moment you want to go out, you can't, and the whole system collapses, or you get the elite capture stuff that always 
the, the, all kinds of people will take advantage of it and not necessarily legally but but um but um but 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 yeah but but in other ways as well yeah and so so you need to understand that so the the minimum amount is understand locally nationally this political economy these relationships between wealth power uh and the way people work because otherwise we 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 this is an illusion um yeah i have sometimes a, a saying i wish we had we had in some in many countries uh far fewer four wheel drives and far and, and a little bit more understanding of the places we we have so many people working there with zero understanding of these places Absolutely. And then one final question from Sue. If China has been so successful in reducing poverty, what elements of their policy and system do you see as accounting for this? OK, so then thank you for that question. OK, so I will start with a quick statement in saying we only have one thing that we can learn from China, and it's not how they reduce poverty That's and, or, or anything else. And the one thing I will come to in a moment, but but we need to understand um, we need to understand that China was a, is a very and and you know it probably has most similarities with say with Korea and Japan, and that actually means kind of defined borders for thousands of years, uh, or at least at the core of it. I, I should be careful here. It's not not in that, but defined a defined core of the country for 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 thousands of years, centralized administration for such a long time. A meritocratic bureaucracy even now that you have to do all these state exams to come into it and you have centralized taxation for a long time so you have all these features that we say we have a strong state to actually make me say that basically if i ever do state-led development i would probably pick china or korea because they have the history of the state-led development and that's that's how they did it so what we can't learn from china is that we should get a state in Malawi a lot of a big role to do development because the state in Malawi is built up with a lot of um, with a lot of clientelism. Jobs are given because as reward for loyalty and whatever. That's a bit like the Bangladesh state that we had. It's extremely it's a it's a much weaker state. You can't do then a China type model in these places. And so, but what you can learn is that China looked for when Deng Xiaoping wanted to focus on growth and development. They found a way of doing that within their own system. Even within, they couldn't, they had to do it through the party because that was essential. They had to do it through the centralized systems. And they found a way of creating enough learning and accountability in the system that actually didn't get wasted like the Nigerian health systems, but actually they started to work. And it comes back to this, a deep underlying commitment to actually wanting to be successful in growth development. That's what we often miss in the places. And combined with an awareness of the systems that you can work with, the self-aware state. So Malawi will have to find something that is not simply dependent on the state doing it, just as Bangladesh found something, including with BRAC, to do something quite different. Different countries that were successful, they need to find something with enough accountability uh, relative to the objectives that you have on growth and development, and then you can be successful. So that's, I think, the core part. So nothing else of the detail on China, but that core part of the underlying commitment and self-awareness of what you have. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Stefan. Thank you all for your wonderful questions and Steph, for your fantastic presentation. And just to point out to everyone, Stefan's book is now out in hardback. I think very shortly we'll be out in paperback. So That's please great. do go and find out more with a copy. I will certainly be buying one. Um, so just so you know, this is unfortunately the final part of our Jesus International series. Thank you for those of you who've joined either just tonight or across the series. Uh, the first two are up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we are working to make sure the others will be as well. Um, you can also find our previous Jesus Futures series all up on there if you'd like to watch them back. Uh, we will be doing another Zoom series. Uh, I haven't quite decided what the topic will be yet, but what I would like to say is if you have ideas of members of our Jesus academic community who you'd like to speak, do just drop me an email. Uh, I can tell you that one of the talks this time was suggested to me by an alumnus. So if you have an idea, I can't guarantee we'll be able to include them, but uh, please let me know and see what we can do. However, if you are able to join us in person uh, during the spring, um, there are two opportunities to support wonderful extracurricular activities of our students. On the 13th of May, it's the next part of the Jesus College Shakespeare project with Henry VI part three. There'll be a lot of bodies on the battlefield for that. And then on the 27th of May, you can cheer on uh, Jesus College Boat Club at Summer Eights down at the Boathouse on the 27th. 
We will also be having two more events in London in June. Uh, we haven't yet announced those, but keep an eye out. There'll be some wonderful places for you to join us there. And we'll shortly be announcing our calendar for the next academic year as well. But just say thank you so much. Thank you for being here and for joining us this evening. Thank you once again to Stefan and good night.